All right, I think it's time to get started, everybody. Um, welcome. It's so great to have you on today for our webinar, Understanding How School Districts Can Use COVID-19 Relief Funding to Transform School Health. We're really excited you could take the time to join us today and hope you get a lot out of it. My name is Annie Reed, and I'm the National Director of Thriving Schools at Kaiser Permanente where we are co-hosting today's webinar uh, with AASA, the School Superintendents Association, Future Ed and Healthy Schools Campaign. Next slide, please. So our web webinar today will run for about an hour and we'll be sending a link to the slides and the recording uh, to, to all the participants early next week. We'll do our best to save 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session with our speakers. So please uh, ask your questions throughout the duration of the webinar using the questions box located on your control panel. And feel free to send questions through the questions box at any time. We're, um, we'll you know, uh, be monitoring those throughout. So I just want to do a quick introduction um, to Kaiser Permanente, um, who many of you may be familiar with, but we are um, the nation's largest integrated healthcare system. We both care for and cover the lives of over 12 million people throughout our eight regions across the country. Um, and we are um, very committed to serving um, our communities because we know that health happens outside the walls of our uh, medical office buildings and, and is really important to address in the communities where our members live, work, and play. And that extends to schools also. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, we know at Kaiser Permanente that, um, as I said, you know, schools are an incredibly important place to address health in our communities. There is a reciprocal impact between health and education. The better educated our, our population is, the healthier they are, um, and, um, and vice versa. And, and we know that schools play an incredibly important role in ensuring that the place where our, our students and, uh, learn and our teachers and staff work are healthy places that address the mind, body, and spirit. Next slide. So today our webinar is going to focus on how school districts specifically can use COVID-19 funding relief to support student and staff health. And as all of you know, over the last year and a half, the federal government has invested more than $190 billion to support schools in reopening for in-person instruction. This influx of federal aid represents a, just an incredibly historic opportunity to create safer and healthier schools in our communities across the nation and to really draw attention to the intersection between health and education. This money can not only help students recover from the pandemic's disruption, but we can also think about it as an opportunity to address some of the systemic health challenges that are, are really, uh, even pre-COVID, have um, kept students from, from fulfilling their, their full academic potential. We feel this work is more important than ever, given the critical content, uh, the connection between health and education that's really been laid bare by this pandemic. Early data show us that the pandemic has negatively impacted health. I'm sure all of you on the webinar today can attest to that. You've probably seen it um, and, and felt it very uh, deeply and personally, as well as in your professional lives. And we know that mental health is, is um, of particular interest um, and, and particularly alarming. Um, we know, for example, that mental health related emergency department visits are up 24% for children between the ages of 5 and 11 and 31% for youth aged 12 to 17. So if we want to really ensure that our students are healthy and ready to learn and begin to address the profound impact that the pandemic has had both on health and learning of students and staff, we really need to think about how to support school districts and strategically using this historic investment to transform the environments where our, our students, staff, and teachers spend most of their, their waking hours. So we'll spend our time today really tackling this issue by giving an overview of the available funding streams of COVID-19 relief, highlighting concrete examples about the ways that school districts can spend the money to support student and staff health. And as I mentioned, we'll also have time for Q&A. We're also so thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Paul Imhoff, who's the superintendent of the Upper Arlington Schools in Ohio and uh, the current president of AASA. And he'll be sharing more about how his district is supporting student staff um, and teacher health and what they're doing to use the COVID-19 funding specifically to advance their work. Next slide, thanks. 
So um, today's content, it really focuses on um, guidance that was produced jointly by AESA, Future Ed, Healthy Schools Campaign, and Kaiser Permanente. And we released that last month. We'll drop that link in the chat. The guidance includes a roadmap to support healthy school uh, reopening for in-person instruction um, and using COVID-19 relief to advance student and staff health with, with those dollars. The funding is in the process of being distributed now, for those of you who have, may have questions sort of on the timing of this. Um, and we know that school district decision makers, many of you who are on the call today, um, are in the process of deciding how to spend the funding. So our four organizations teamed up to develop the guidance um, and really to get it into your hands so um, that it can inform the decision making process. And, and we're hoping um, that we learn a lot about that today. We also hope that today's webinar will help everyone understand really how to leverage this historic opportunity and provide you with ideas for how the funding can be strategically spent in your communities in a, in a um, sustainable and responsive way. So as I said, we'll, we'll drop that link um, into the, the um, chat box. So please do check out that guidance if you haven't already. Um, so um, now let's get down to the to the the fun part of this. Um, we have just such an incredible lineup of speakers today, and I'm I'm grateful to all of you guys for taking the time to be here and, and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Phyllis Jordan will be kicking things off with an overview of of COVID nineteen relief funding. She'll be followed by Alex Mays, who will walk us through steps on uh, that school districts can take to ensure they're strategically spending the funding and, and give us some great examples from around the country about how to use the funds. And then we'll turn it over to Dr. Imhoff, who will close us out um, to really ground us in a perspective about how the funds are being used to support his district in Upper Arlington um, to, uh, to work on health and wellness. Before we get started, though, we just want to do, to do a quick poll um, to make sure we know who is with us today. So please take a moment to complete the poll and let us know um, who, what sort of best represents you. Uh, are you a school health provider? Are you a teacher or a principal or a other school staff member? Do you work at a district? Um, we'll leave this up for 20 seconds or so so that everybody can respond and then we will share the results. Great. Okay, it looks like we have a nice distribution here um, with 41% as other. So I'm, I'm <coughs> totally curious to see, um, tell us who you are and um, in, in the chat so that we have a good sense of who's on the call today. Um, and again, thanks for being with us and, and I will turn it over to our illustrious panel and um, over to you, Phyllis. Thanks so much, Annie. Um, can you move to the next slide? Um, I'm from Future Ed, which is a think tank at Georgetown University's um, Court School of Public Policy. And as Future Ed, we focus on the future of education. But for the past couple of years, education has been all about COVID and uh, how kids and how schools are doing in the pandemic. And so and, uh, we've been paying a lot of attention to what's going on with the relief money that Congress has approved. Now, as you all probably know, there have been three rounds of it that add up uh, to, in, uh, to about 190 billion in um, sub aid to schools. Um, and there's also money for higher ed and there's money that goes to governors. But the money that most people talk about is what's called the ESSER fund, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. And that goes, that goes to public schools and it flows through the Title I formula for schools with concentrated poverty. So schools with higher needs tend to be getting more money under this formula. Next slide, please. Um, so um, Annie was saying this is a historic infusion of federal funds. And this is just an illustration of how this money compares. The Title I money, the second dot, um, is how much about per pupil went in Title I money to schools. Um, and then you can see that the last two, uh, especially the American Russia Plan, but the last two plans for COVID relief money provide more money than Title I does. Um, so we've got a lot of money, a historic infusion, and about three years to spend it. So the uh, challenge for schools is how to do that in 
ways that are going to support students and how to do that in ways that they can sustain past that three year period. Next slide. The um, allowable uses for this money are quite broad. You can, um, you can use it for construction. You can use it for masks. You can use it for computers. Um, I sort of pulled out um, some of the allowable uses that relate to um, health. And Alex is going to go into more detail on this. But there are two basic health priorities that this COVID relief money can be spent for. The first is safely reopening schools getting the testing, getting those vaccinations, getting the schools clean, getting better ventilation. In some places they're doing whole overhauls of their HVAC systems to just have better air in the school. Also for staff training and overtime. Likewise, uh, the second priority is really addressing the mental health and the physical health needs of students and of teachers um, and other staff. There's, as as we know, there's been a lot of mental health, there's a lot of trauma, a lot of isolation, a lot of loss in the past year and a half. So uh, there's an increase in there's the mental health counseling is specifically mentioned in each of the COVID relief bills as a allowable priority. There's um, an emphasis on SEL programs, on finding ways to re-engage students socially and emotionally. Um, hiring folks and buying equipment and creating the kind of community collaborations that can help uh, bring services to the kids who need them. Uh, next slide. So in terms of how this money is flowing, um, it was approved, the American Rescue Plan, which is the biggest chunk of money, was approved uh, by Congress in March. Uh, Two thirds of it went to the states later that month. But um, the education department said, before you get the last third, we want you to submit a plan for how you're going to spend the money, and we want districts to, to submit plans. Now, 50 states have submitted their plans, 49 states in D.C. We're the only one missing right now is Florida, and about 37 of them have been approved, which means uh, those states have all have received all the money for the Amer from the American Rescue Plan. 90% of that money has to go to schools and to LEAs or charters um, to any sort of local education agency. And the 10% can stay with the state and they can use do statewide priorities. Um, next slide. Um, so one thing we've been doing at Future Ed is every time a state submits a plan to the education department, we're looking to see what sort of priorities they're, what, what are they prioritizing? We, we, we've pulled out a few things. And the number one thing that comes up again and again is student mental health and staff mental health and social emotional learning. There's this great recognition now, it's really historic in people's understanding how much a student's health, mental health is gonna connect to their academic growth. And so there's a big emphasis on training and providing staff and providing uh, professional development needed to help students. There's an, also a big uh, emphasis on tutoring. We found 35 states are doing something to support tutoring. Of course, local districts will be doing it, but the states are setting up teacher or uh, tutoring cores, or they're providing grants for tutoring, or they're working with AmeriCorps. Um, 26 states are making some sort of initiative toward attendance. And, and, you know, uh, turning around absenteeism. We found in the uh, pandemic that absenteeism rates have grown in a lot of places and that kids are not just missing school. It's not only more kids missing school, the kids who are chronically absent are missing more and more days. Some kids are missing like half the school year. Uh, this, of course, attendance is closely tied to health. First, because illness remains the number one reason kids miss school, but two, um, you know, if kids have to quarantine, that's absenteeism. Those kids aren't in school. And three, um, kids who are depressed and anxious and having mental health issues are going to miss school too. So absenteeism in that sense becomes an indicator of what's going on. And then we find a lot of states are doing data upgrades, which we're really encouraged about because um, so much of supporting students is about having the right data, having it in hand, knowing who needs what sort of support. Next slide. Um, this next slide is from the Center for Reinventing Public Education, 
which is a think tank in uh, Washington state, which is uh, polling a hundred large districts and finding out how they're using their COVID relief money. And you'll see up here that social emotional learning and mental health supports is 43 of their districts they're, uh, they're polling or doing that. Um, you know, supporting kids making up for lost time is big, um, supporting teacher capacity. So, you know, their attendance shows up there in 12 of their districts. So there are a lot, um, you know, of ways that districts are using this. All these ways that are mentioned here are clearly in the allowable uses categories. Uh, next slide. I think that's it for what my overview. I'm happy to answer more. I know so much about this stuff that I'm happy to answer more questions. Here's a few of the COVID uh, relief uh, resources that are on our website. The one getting to yes on COVID relief spending is one that we went through the attendant, the um, education department's guidance on what are allowable uses and and search for the word yes and came up with about 50 to 60 things that they say yes are allowable. So these are good elements or good uh, resources for tracking that down. And I will also note that beyond the ESSER money, there's, there's other money that um, is in the American Rescue Plan and other COVID relief <coughs> bills that affects health. There's money for screening, there's money for vaccinations, there's money for helping students with disabilities, money for helping homeless students. Uh, there's money for national service programs, which can help you get AmeriCorps workers who could help you do the contact tracing and the testing. So um, there's, there's lots of resources in these bills to help, um, to help with health and lots of resources um, you know, aimed at helping disadvantaged students particularly. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alex, um, who can give you more detail about the best ways to plan for this and to use the money. Great. Thank you so much, Phyllis, for teeing that up and for the great introduction uh, to really this historic opportunity. So I'm Alex Mays. I'm the National Program Director for Healthy Schools Campaign. We are thrilled to be co-hosting today's session um, with so many great partners. And Today, I want to dig in a little bit more around what Phyllis shared, and one of the things that we just are hearing overwhelmingly from school districts is that they recognize that this funding is a historic opportunity, but there's a sense of being overwhelmed about how this funding can be used. And so one of the things that we really sought to do in the guidance that we co-developed was come up with some guiding principles to inform districts work around spending this funding. Um, and so I'll review that and then give some more concrete examples of ways in which the funding can be used. Next slide. So as districts begin to think about how to utilize this funding, um, these are five guiding principles that we've been really highlighting um, to walk through kind of step-by-step -step approaching spending this aid in a really strategic way. And for those of you who are joining who aren't, in a school district who are advocates, who are working at the national level on this, who are with healthcare systems or public health. I think these steps really also highlight opportunities for you all to be involved in this process as well. Um, so first and foremost, we are really encouraging school districts to look at the data that they already have and make data informed decisions around spending this funding. There's an incredible amount of great data that districts already have, whether that's chronic absence data, as Phyllis mentioned, or information at the county level around public health needs, um, student health information records, data from your healthcare providers, that all that information can really help understand what are the leading student and staff health needs that we should be thinking about addressing with these funds. And then we're really encouraging districts to think about how they can utilize the funds to amplify existing assets and programs within their school and community. We know there's an incredible amount of work going on already, great work that's happening in school districts around supporting health and wellness. And this funding can really um, go a long way in terms of amplifying and scaling that work. And to the extent that those programs aren't being implemented in schools um, within your community, this can be a tremendous um, opportunity to really replicate that work. 
uh, we're encouraging everybody to engage staff, caregivers, youth, community members in this work. The American Rescue Plan and actually all the funding, um, all the stimulus bills have really explicit language around engaging in robust um, community feedback and engagement as a part of developing plans for how these funds can be used. Um, and this, we just feel like is such a critical step to really understanding what the needs are within your schools and communities that can be addressed with these funds. Um, and then you know, looking at where, aligning those needs that are identified, looking at the existing programs you know have worked, and thinking about what are evidence-based or at least evidence-informed interventions that can be used to meet those needs. Um, we know there is a lot out there to choose from, and really looking at the evidence base and what um, that tells us about programs and interventions that work to address the identified needs is such a key principle to guide this work. And then finally, I think probably the number one concern we have been hearing from districts around this work is that they recognize this is a historic investment, but it's a one-time investment. And what happens when that funding is spent? So we've really been encouraging districts to think about as they're choosing programs and interventions, thinking about ones for which there can be sustainable funding after the funds are spent. Um, the funding can also be used to draw down additional sustainable sources of funding, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we hope that these principles can really help shape thinking as you're unpacking how to really leverage this historic opportunity. Next slide. I did just want to take a moment to build out a little more around the sustainable funding piece, since we know this is such a top concern. Um, these are just some examples of sustainable funding mechanisms that are available to school districts to support health and wellness within schools and to continue efforts that are initiated with COVID relief dollars that support student and staff health and wellness. Um, so through the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the nation's K-12 education law and distributes significant funding to public schools across the country, there is funding um, that has a lot of flexibility around how it can be used and certainly can be used to support health and wellness. Um, Title I is the largest pot of funding that goes to low-income school districts. Um, again, there's a lot of flexibility in being able to utilize that fund to support health and wellness. Um, Medicaid is a, a really key opportunity that we've been lifting up throughout this work. Um, because Medicaid currently plays a key role in funding health and wellness work within school districts, but there's a lot of opportunities to expand um, work happening around school Medicaid and draw down additional federal Medicaid dollars to support health and wellness work in schools. And we feel like this is a really important one to lift up because it is healthcare funding that can be brought into school districts um, and it is sustainable. So all school districts, all states do have school Medicaid programs. Many currently bill for services that are in students' individualized education programs. And in 16 states, there's billing that's happening outside of those IEPs. Um, but it's a really key opportunity to invest these funds to strengthen that work. And that could look like hiring Medicaid eligible school health providers within your district, hiring a district school Medicaid coordinator if you don't have one, um, investing in technology platforms or electronic health record systems to really strengthen work around health service delivery. Um, and then food and nutrition programs have a long history, um, particularly the USDA school, uh, free and reduced school uh, lunch and breakfast programs of providing funding um, for health and wellness work and particularly healthy school meals within schools. And then there are lots of opportunities around federal grant programs, community partnerships and philanthropy. The guide includes a lot more details about these options, but I just really wanted to underscore um, that there are opportunities to continue work that you initiate within your district through this COVID relief funding. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to build on the great introduction that Phyllis gave and just give some more concrete examples of how eligible uses of COVID relief funding. This list is by no means exhaustive, um, but we know that people are just desperate for information around how these funds can be utilized. And so in the guidance, we came up with a, a set of buckets and grouped our um, recommendations and potential eligible uses according to those. So that's how this information is structured. 
I think above all, I just want to emphasize that there is a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of how this funding can be utilized to support student and staff health and wellness, and that these decisions are being made now, and they're going to be continued to be made in the coming months. So it's a fantastic opportunity to get involved if you aren't already, understand how your district is spending these funds, and really, again, think about what that data tells you about the needs within your community and how these funds can be utilized to support those needs. Um, so the first bucket is COVID prevention, just some examples of ways in which the, the funds can be used are for PPE, to hire school health providers to support COVID testing surveillance, um, repair school facilities, that's a key one that we're seeing a lot of districts thinking about utilizing the funding for purchasing cleaning supplies and equipment all great uses. Um, we've been seeing a number of districts hire um, school health providers to really support the rollout of COVID testing, surveillance, and vaccinations, which is fantastic. Um, we spoke with a district recently who's utilizing the funding. Um, they put new HVAC or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems in every single school building. That's a fantastic use of the funds because it's something that will support the health and wellness of kids for years to come, um, not just while these funds are available. Um, and then staff and teacher well-being is a key bucket that I really encourage everybody to think about. We know that this is one of the most underfunded areas when it comes to school health and wellness. And so really thinking about using these funds um, to support staff and teacher well-being is key. You know, that can be providing health supports on site. It can be, you know, supporting broader transformations in the school environment around school climate or trauma-informed practices, um, but a key uh, opportunity for supporting that work. Next slide. And Phyllis underscored this, but certainly we know top of mind for many people is mental health and well-being. Um, there's a lot of very um, explicit language within the American Rescue Plan around how this funds can be used to support mental health and well-being. Uh, a lot of great thinking going on around using, utilizing the funds for data collection um, to assess student and staff health and wellness needs. Um, hiring school health providers, implementing social emotional learning programs, um, and then really the same for physical health and well-being, hiring school health providers, um, investing in data infrastructure, thinking about telehealth opportunities. Um, so a lot of fantastic opportunities around that. Next slide. And then I think again, um, two opportunities that um, districts might not be thinking about quite as much are around social drivers of health, you know, thinking about opportunities to use these funds to address institutional racism, food security, homelessness, all things that can be done, um, you know, it, partially addressed with these funds, um, hiring community school coordinator to coordinate delivery of services and programs for students and families thinking about providing training for staff around equity, around restorative justice. Um, those would all be fantastic uses of these funds. Um, and same around family engagement and community involvement, providing training to staff, um, really thinking about you know, hosting regular meetings with community members and families to ensure that they're thoughtfully engaged within this work now and then ongoing into the future. And then finally, um, I just wanted to highlight um, possible uses of this funding on the next slide um, to address physical education, physical activity, health education. Um, again, a key need we know that many districts face. Um, so funds can be used to hire the staff to implement that work, to deliver high quality PE or health education, upgrade school facilities um, to support access to physical activity, and we're seeing a lot of districts also utilizing the funds to make necessary accommodations to continue doing physical activity um, in, while complying with public health protocols. So next slide. Um, this is just a snapshot. I apologize, it's small, but this is sort of a teaser. Again, encouraging you to check out the guidance. Um, it has a chart that pulls together all of this information that highlights the data sources to better understand what the needs are within your community highlight short-term uses as well as long-term uses. We really want to encourage districts to think about not only how they can invest these funds to meet the immediate needs, but how they can invest these funds in capacity building and infrastructure to support student and staff health and wellness in the long run. And then we also highlight sustainable sources of funding um, to continue the work initiated with these dollars. Next slide. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Paul Imhoff um, from Upper Arlington Schools. While I'm reading his introduction, I'm going to launch another poll question um, just to get your input once again. Um, we want to know, I shared kind of some key buckets that we've been thinking about and when we think about the greatest student and staff health needs within communities, we want to know what is top of mind for you all. Is it COVID prevention, mental health and well-being, physical health and well-being, social drivers of health? Take a moment to respond to that and I'll introduce Dr. Imhoff. Um, Dr. Imhoff is the superintendent of Upper Arlington Schools in Ohio and is currently the president of AASA, the School Superintendents Association. Dr. Imhoff has 19 years of administrative experience in public education and prior to moving into administrative roles, he spent seven years teaching high school English and junior high language arts and reading. He's the 2018 Ohio Superintendent of the Year and we are just thrilled to have him with us today to share more about the work that he's been leading in Upper Arlington Schools to support health and wellness and how they're utilizing COVID relief funding to do this work. Um, so I will just share the results briefly. Um, looks like mental health and well-being is the top concern, which I think is, is no surprise followed by COVID prevention, but a real nice mix and happy to see that staff wellness is on the radar of a lot of people joining us today. So with that, um, I will hand it over to Dr. Imhoff to share more about what is happening in Upper Arlington. Okay, thanks a lot, Alice. It's great to, Alex, it's uh, great to be with all of you this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, where you are. And I'm going to talk to you about what's going on in Ohio, and I'm going to talk to you about what's going on uh, with our work at AASA as well. But before I do that, and before I start with my prepared slides, I just, I want to mention something there. There are a lot of folks on this webinar uh, today. And there are a lot of folks who are passionate about this topic, about focusing on the well-being of our kids and our staff. And I'm reminded of what happens every time I get on an airplane. And every time I get on an airplane, there are instructions about what to do when the oxygen masks fall. And if you're traveling with a younger person, you are told not to put the oxygen mask on them first, but you're told to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, to take care of yourself first, so then you are able to take care of others who may need you. And I think with all the folks on this webinar today, I want to remind you about that. I want to remind you, this has been an incredibly long journey, and it's not over yet. And I hope all of you are taking time to take care of yourselves. Um, I feel like looking at the profiles of the folks on this call, you're all so dedicated to serving others. I just want to make sure that you're taking that time to take care of yourself so you are able to continue to serve others. And I think we need to hear that message again and again and again. So I hope you don't mind me starting with that, but I think that is important for all of us. So if, if we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, as we're talking about this work, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but this is the mission and vision and the core values for our school uh, a, 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 a district. And the reason I bring this up is both at AASA and in our district, we've been focusing on the well-being of our kids prior to this, this, uh, this pandemic. And the pandemic has just made it even more important for us to continue uh, on in this work. But one of the things I think it's important for all of us who are leading the work out in the field is we always have to start with the why, right? Why is this important? It could be tempting just to jump into the work because there's so much work there and assume everyone knows why it's important. But you know what? Everyone doesn't know why. And so I encourage everyone to always take that pause and talk about the why. And so we talk in our schools about challenging and supporting every student every step of the way. We are an organization that exists to teach kids, but we can't teach kids who aren't well. So the kids have to be well before they can learn. Our staff has to be well before they can serve. And so we start with this why so people understand why this is so important to our work of teaching and learning and how it's foundational and how the work can't even go forward if we don't get that why correct. And so next slide, please. So in August of 2019, our Board of Education put a strategic plan in place. 
And as you see on this slide, our plan only has two goals. The first is a whole learning goal. That's about what's going on inside the classroom. That's about that core business of teaching and learning. And the other goal is to focus on the student and staff well, well, well being. Uh, and then it's undergirded with a foundation of always getting better at, at getting better. But we only have two goals as a district. And one of those goals is to focus on the well being of our students and staff. And one of the things I know from leading organizations for years and years and years, if you have too many goals, you aren't going to get anything done. And so you really have to focus on what matters most if you really want to make improvements in those areas. And so in our schools, we are literally focusing on the classroom and we're focusing on the well-being of our students and staff. And again, I just use that as an example of something we had in place even before uh, the, uh, the, pan uh, the pandemic, but it's become obviously even more important. Next slide. So as we look at the well-being of our students and staff, we actually break it into two categories, as you see here, right? A sense of belonging and a sense of balance. And so again, language is important, and we just can't talk about the well-being of students and staff. We have to define what, what we mean by that. And so this is where we do that. Um, equity is very important to us, and the relationship part of what we do is very important to us. I believe that public schools especially are a place where everyone can come together, where everyone is embraced, and where everyone is loved. And when we are at our best, we are that. But for everyone to be well, we have to be that. Next slide. And so when we look at funding, and I'm going to get into some more of the specifics, but, but this federal funding for school districts around the country has been transformational. Um, and so we've received, as, as you can see, almost $4 million. Um, and we have worked together uh, with, with our teams, and we've based our decisions on the strategic plan work that was already in place that involved our staff and, 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 and our students and, and, and members of our community. But keeping that goal of supporting our students' academic and well and well-being needs at the center of what we do, again, in the in the use of these funds, we have been very specific again about our why. What is our why? How do we want to use these funds and how can these funds make a difference for kids? Next slide. And so I'm going to be talking to you about a partnership that uh, that we've recently put uh, put in place with uh, uh, with Ohio State. Uh, we are using a well-being survey for students. We happen to use the uh, the Panorama survey. You've already heard about the importance of gathering data. We have used some other instruments in the past, and we have transitioned to this because we think it's a better fit for our work. But again, we want to make sure that the work we are doing is based upon our data. Uh, we had an online uh, a, 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 a academy last year, and we have one for this year as well. We are funding that uh, work. Uh, this, this last summer, we had uh, summer offerings for all students free of charge. And we're gonna be offering those for the next two summers, again, free of charge using these federal dollars. Um, and we offer uh, content, obviously, courses. So if you need caught up in literacy or in math, we offer that and that is important, but we offer so much more. We also offer interest-based uh, classes for our kids because Throughout uh, the, uh, the pandemic, I think we learned even more than we ever knew before the importance of being able to, uh, to come together and be together. And so just, just this last summer, we had safe ways for our kids to be able to come in, in person and again, and focus both on content and interest-based items. Um, and the kids, there was an overwhelming response to this. And again, and this, and this deals with, with the both sides of the equation, dealing with the, academic, with the academic needs of our kids and on the well-being needs, needs of our kids. And so, and being able to offer this free of charge uh, is just great. And we had so many kids who have taken advantage of this. Um, and that has just been uh, fa fantastic. And then, of course, I'm sure like many of you, uh, taking care of all those basic needs, all of the PPE and all the additional cleaning supplies, 
uh, that has been an important part uh, of this funding effort. And again, we're just uh, really, really, really thankful for the dollars uh, that, that have flowed to public schools around the country. Next slide. And so I do want to talk about uh, AASA as well, and I'm really proud of the work that we're doing on the national scale. And again, I always talk about, I always like to start with the why. This is our why as an organization, as we support leaders who lead our public schools across our country. And this is why we are here to advocate for equitable access for all students. And we want all students to have the highest quality public education. And so we support leaders in, in order to make that happen. And so going to the next slide, one of the things we have done specifically, and this actually started prior, uh, prior to our, our, our pandemic, we actually have a cohort of schools around the country who are focusing on SEL work. And that's led by Dr. Sheldon Berman and Dr. Don, Don, Don Bridges. Uh, and our school district happens to be a part of this cohort, but this has been an amazing opportunity for us to come together virtually uh, from all over our country and focus on this work, um, focusing on the why and then how do we make a meaningful difference uh, in the lives of our kids from that well, well, well-being uh, per per perspective. And there's more information about this on, 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 on our website. But again, it's been an amazing opportunity just to focus on the well-being of our kids and our staff. Next slide. And so one of the things, um, and I'm, I, I, was, I was moving on uh, prematurely, these are some of the things as, uh, as a part of the cohort we have done. I'll leave that there for a second. But again, it's, it's just been a great uh, sharing opportunity. And one of the things that, that the cohort did uh, talk about a lot at the beginning is that school districts uh, get involved in this type of work. Uh, that oftentimes we go right to focusing on students because that is who we are and that is good and that is right, but we forget to support our staff as well. And as I said at the beginning, if our staff isn't well, they cannot support our students. So in this work, we obviously have to support our staff and our students. Next slide. And so I wanted to spend just my last couple of minutes talking about a partnership we have formed uh, with the Wexner Medical Center at, 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 at Ohio State. And this has happened uh, just over the last six, six months. Uh, like other schools around the country, the mental health issues uh, that are uh, coming from our kids are growing and growing and growing. And in our schools, we have amazing counselors, uh, we have amazing nurses. We have wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, su su supports, but it just wasn't enough. Um, and so we began talking uh, with uh, with Wexner Medical Center at, at at Ohio State, talking about a partnership. And so they actually worked with us, and the folks over there are fantastic. Um, and we are together building a model that's a first of its kind in in, in our area to provide well-being services for our kids. And our goal here is then to build this model and then to be able to share it with others so it can be replicated with the healthcare uh, pro 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 providers uh, in, in, in other parts of our state and country. Go to the next slide. So just a few of the specifics uh, that, that are gonna be a part of this. We're gonna have a full-time manager on site in our school. Uh, that is going to be helping to lead and to coordinate this 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 work, and that is incredibly important to have that help. Everyone is spread thin, and we really need someone who is focusing just on this every day. And then we're going to start with two full time psychotherapists in in our, our our district, and this is scalable, and so and so we can add, um, and so they are going to work with our school counseling team. Uh, and going to be uh, able to offer on-site services for our kids. And then one of the other things that we think is crucial in this is because of the partnership, uh, our families are going to get priority access to uh, all of the behavioral health services uh, at the Wexner Medical Center. Uh, and this, again, is a game changer for our families. And so we're excited about the partnership. And this is a partnership that would not have been possible without the federal funding that, that, that has been offered to us. And so again, we are just so, so thankful for that. Um, moving on, next slide. 
And just wanted to mention uh, the uh, the well the well being survey again that 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 we are using uh, and that's going to be administered. Well, it, it was administered in the spring of last year, and we're going to administer it next month, and then again in the spring. And this this data is uh, going to continue to be important to us and drive our decision making. And next slide. Um, we're also being really uh, intentional, uh, asking our kids to reflect on their own mindsets and preparing our, our our teachers for that for that work. So this can be integrated into everything we are doing uh, in the district and in the classroom. And our equity work is an incredibly important part of this. I don't think we can really focus on the well-being of staff and students if we're not focusing on equity as well. Uh, and so that has been a, a big, big part of of what we have done. And so uh, that is the end of what I wanted to share. And again, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I wanna thank everything for all you're doing for kids. Wow, um, thank you so much, Dr. Imhoff. And also to Phyllis and Alex for um, providing the context for this conversation. <clears throat> I will just say, um, I don't know about all of you on, on the webinar today, but I feel like um, inspiration sometimes feels like it's in short supply these days, but uh, Dr. Imhoff, the way, um, I mean, there are about 16 things that I could talk about <laughs> that, that really um, captivated sort of my interest and just were so incredibly um, uh, inspiring about the way that, that you are um, structuring your work and prioritizing health for everything from just the, the simplicity of the two goals to the focus on equity and belonging. Um, so thank you for your leadership, and I hope this is um, that we will all get to, to sort of follow your progress and learn from your leadership in, in this area. Um, thank you. So thank you so much for that. Um, maybe I'll start uh, with you, Dr. Imhoff, as we get into the, the Q&A, and I'd encourage folks to continue adding their questions in, in the chat. Um, can can you talk about how, as you set up this incredible sort of response um, to, to the needs that you're seeing in, in your community, um, you're thinking about sustainability beyond the three years of, of the federal dollars. And I would, um, I think you touched on that a little bit, but would love to hear you sort of drill down into that. And then Phyllis and Alex um, would similarly love to hear about sort of any advice you would you would give um, to the folks on the on the call today about about how to really bake that in um, to their planning process. So I'll start with you, Dr. Imhoff. So part of that is still a work in in uh, in in progress because quite frankly, some of this is being done just in a triage mode. The needs are so great, we are jumping in, and uh, in many ways, we're building the plane as we fly it, and that's okay, and that that is okay, and so. Uh, we are lucky we already have uh, one funding stream uh, that is going to be in place uh, after the federal dollars run out, which is a dedicated uh, funding source from the state of, of Ohio uh, focused on the well-being of our kids. And so I think advocating at the state level for dedicated dollars uh, for these areas is important. And I'm proud of our state leaders in the state of Ohio for making that happen. Uh, we also have uh, an education foundation in in our community, and we work with them as well, and they have been a partner in this work. And as far as how all of this is going to stay in place financially after the three years, I don't have that done yet, but that is something that we are working on and will have to be a part of the plan because I don't see the day when these needs are going to lessen. I think uh, we're going to have to continue to scale the work up. But we will make it a priority and we will find the money because uh, it goes back to what I said before. We have to focus on this before we can do everything else. Absolutely. Yeah, Phyllis, you wanna? Um, well, I would, I would urge people, and I'm sure there's already a lot of this going on, to tap community resources. Build in um, like Dr. Imhoff's uh, effort with Ohio State University, build in professionals and nonprofits and other government agencies in your community that are doing this work. So mental health, it's great to have mental health providers on staff, but if you can bring in people from the community, especially in a surge time when you really need them, and then you can you can adjust as instead of hiring people and having to fire them or, or, or lay them off. Um, you know, there are models of community schools, communities in schools, um, that uh, have a coordinator who brings together all the community assets um, 
And that's a really good approach. And interestingly, from a sustainability point of view, the uh, Biden education budget has a huge increase for community schools. So there is federal support for this approach. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm a big fan of AmeriCorps. I actually have a uh, kid who's a uh, college senior majoring in philosophy and religion and trying to figure out what to do with his life. I'm like, join AmeriCorps. Um, but, uh, but yeah, th this is an approach. You get kids, mostly kids right out of college, some not yet in college, but who can really help out be extra hands in the school. Uh, every state has a national service commission that can coordinate and connect school districts with these workers. And also United Ways often have connect relationships with AmeriCorps and can connect you. And then City Year, which is sort of a uh, intermediary has a lot of connections. So those would be my suggestions. And I just echoing everything that's been said, and then I would um, just emphasize looking at non-education sources too, and really thinking about ways that healthcare dollars can be leveraged. I mentioned Medicaid. I think there's a lot of opportunities around using these funds to um, really access some new new resources to support this work. Great. Um, Thank you all. So, so a lot of you mentioned, and I think specifically, Phil, as you and, and Dr. Imhoff, you you uh, really talked about identifying partners um, to help support this work. And I think a lot of um, uh, district leaders, in particular, have found themselves in in sort of a new um, arena of public health leadership that perhaps they had not um, been trained for or had to do. But finding sort of these. Um, these new levels of collaboration with, with public health agencies and other nonprofits um, in their communities to, to address the urgency of the pandemic. When you think about sort of the, the next phase of, of responding to the pandemic and beyond, what are, what are, what's the advice you would give folks about how to identify the kinds of partners um, that are really gonna add a lot of value um, and, and, and you know, uh, be the kind of partners that you really need? Um, uh, as you continue this work. Are the guardrails that so you- So do you wanna go first, Phyllis, or do you want me to take that first or? Go first, yeah. So I think the partnership with, uh, uh, with uh, o -O 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 Ohio State is a good uh, example. Uh, we also have a partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is a large children's hospital here in town. Um, and their resources are amazing. Um, and I will tell you, um, and um, so we're in a room here with only 140 people, so I'm sure this will stay a secret when I say this, but I will tell you, as a superintendent of a large district in central Ohio, um, I did not know our public health officials before the pandemic, but I do now. Um, and they are amazing, dedicated leaders. Um, and I think one of the great things that is coming out of the pandemic is schools are more connected to public health than ever before. And I think that's going to pay dividends for us moving out of the pandemic because they have amazing teams, again, of dedicated folks. So these, the, there are partnerships that have been born in the struggle uh, that are going to last beyond the pandemic whenever that is. And so I think uh, keeping those bonds in place to serve our kids and our staff are going to be important. So I think uh, reaching out to all of the local folks and partnering with public health. And I think realizing as a superintendent, um, for those on the call who may be a superintendent or a school leader, um, we are experts at teaching kids to read and we're experts at teaching kids to, 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 to write. And it's okay to get outside partners to focus on the mental health issues for them to team with, with our folks. Um, just so we can make sure that we're offering everything possible to meet all of these needs for the kids. So don't be afraid to call the hospital and don't be afraid to, le to reach out to public health and do what we did and just say, we need help. Um, and so I think you'll be surprised how many people are willing to come alongside if you just say those words. Yeah, and, and uh, Annie, I would add um, one of the challenges and of the partnerships is information sharing because we have privacy rules for students. But this can be overcome, but it's sometimes complicated. And, um, you know, I'm sure that AASA has uh, resources to help districts figure that out. 
Um, but, you know, and it comes up with after school programs and it comes up with tutors and other issues too. So there just needs to be uh, careful attention to how much information you can share in what circumstances you can share it. Yeah, great, great point, Phyllis, um, that HIPAA FERPA um, sometimes can create um, some some roadblocks that make it harder, but but I think as both you and Dr. Imhoff described, it's, uh, the, the dividends probably outweigh the, the initial sort of inputs. Um, all right, I think we have time for a, a question or two more. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, and Dr. Imhoff, maybe I'll start with you on this one about sort of how to incorporate community voice in um, really decision-making around uh, allocation of these, of these dollars. How have you done that? How do you plan to do it? Or how do you wish you'd done it differently? One of the things that's been a part of our school district and many, many schools is obviously our community is heavily involved in our schools. And so we started with that strategic planning process I told you about, which was just for the summer prior to our pandemic. And we had a systematic way of engaging all of the stakeholders. And then throughout the pandemic, um, and this is true in schools across the country, parents have been engaged, okay? Um, and quite frankly, that has been difficult at times because the thoughts and opinions of parents have been varied. Uh, and not always of a singular view, and schools have been in the middle of that. But if you take time to listen, you are getting a lot of feedback on a daily basis, more so than ever before in my 32 to two years uh, in, in, in education. And so what we do is we listen to all of that. So we keep track of all of that. Um, and then uh, we've offered town hall meetings just like this. Uh, this is an opportunity that uh, we have found that uh, sometimes we can get more folks to come to an event virtually than in the olden days when they had to come live. And so we gather feedback there. Online surveys. Uh, uh, we have a way to reach all of our parents uh, quickly. Uh, and I am always thrilled at how many people take advantage of the opportunity to give us feedback on surveys. And so um, I think the webinars, I think the surveys, I think the communication just constantly asking people to weigh in and then listening, realizing though, you're gonna get a lot of different opinions. You can't make everyone happy, but again, you can listen to all of those voices and really have a strong sense of what's most important in your community. Yeah, that's, that's great. And interesting to see how things have shifted um, and in some ways, you know, getting able to get more feedback than before. So that's great. Alex, anything to add from your perspective about, about um, that that information sharing and I'll, I'll um, ask you to make it quick so that we can. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, no, I mean, I think it's just, we have, there, it's such a critical piece of this and that, you know, really tying in the threads of, you know, the partnerships and there's just such a need to, to do this work, to collaborate with community-based organizations, to make sure youth voices are elevated, to make sure community members' are, voices are elevated, and they can play key roles in helping um, collect that information as well and support districts in, in doing that information gathering. Um, so no, just to, to underscore how important it is. Great. All right, well, I wish we had more time for conversation. Um, there's so much to get underneath, and I'm just so um, grateful to our incredible speakers, Phyllis Jordan, Alex Mays, and Dr. Paul Imhoff for sharing their time and expertise with us um, and, and uh, to their sponsor organizations, um, AESA, Future Ed, and Healthy Schools Campaign, who have joined us at Kaiser Permanente around this. I want to lift up briefly that we are engaged in a planning process for a 10-year roadmap for healthy schools that will take a lot of the lessons that we discussed here today about this critical intersection between health and education and develop a shared horizon that we will all aim towards for how to ensure that health in schools is the rule and not the exception by aligning our federal, state, and local funding streams and priorities. Um, so please watch for more to come. We'd love to engage you um, in that process. Um, and just so grateful for this incredibly important conversation. Uh, this is, I think, a key way that we can all support um, equity, health, and academic outcomes for um, students across the country. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.